All right, I'm going to limit this video to 15 minutes, so I'm going to talk fast and I'm going to move fast. This is Why Read by Harold Bloom. Harold Bloom, as we know, is uh, has been teaching at Yale, I believe, for uh, since 1955. So he knows what he's talking about when he talks about reading. He's been teaching literature um, for longer than some of your grandparents have been alive. So uh, Why Read is the title. I'm going to share with you my annotations, and I'm going to start with the first thing I circled, which was this question here. How they read, the they being you in this case, because this is all about you, and what they read cannot depend wholly upon themselves, but why they read must be for their own interest. Okay? So how you read doesn't just depend on you, right? Because the how is something that we work on. Right? That's something we've been working on all year. I'm here to help you. Mr. Daniels is here to help you. Um, and what they read, right? I'm asking you to read certain things. But why they read must be for their own interest. Okay? So the why that comes out of things. So I guess that's a question that I would want you to think about. Why do I read? All right. Now, this text, by the way, is incredibly dense. Okay? That means there's just a lot of information. So, when you're reading this, you might have to read certain things twice. And you're, the idea is that you need to, it's kind of like you read backwards and forwards. You know, you take a stab at this first sentence. It matters if individuals are to retain any capacity to form their own judgments and opinions that they continue to read for themselves. So you kind of think about, do I have an understanding of what that means? And then you add it to the next sentence. This is like, this is a big time reading. So if you have to go back and read something twice, that's totally fine. Um, a question for you. So this sentence here, Bible readers, those who search the Bible for themselves, perhaps exemplify the urgency more plainly than readers of Shakespeare. So if you don't get that sentence, read it until you understand it. What is he talking about? Why does that mean? What is he talking about when he talks about this urgency? And then at the end here, one of the uses of readings is to prepare ourselves for change. And the final change, alas, is universal. What is the final change? And it's kind of like once you, and, and it's something specific. He's not talking about, it's not like a big metaphor for something. It's something specific. It's a word. So I guess I would just challenge you to uh, figure out what he means when he says final change. And if you have, in, in It'll be like a test, right? Like, if you know what he means when he says final change, and you can say, yeah, the final change he's talking about is blank, then you understand it. You understand this paragraph, if you can answer that question. If you can't answer that question, you haven't read it towards understanding, right? A lot of times, y'all read, and it's okay. You know, you kind of read, and then you have an opinion about what you read, right? Uh, I liked it. I didn't like it. Uh, I, it was boring, okay? Well, that's fine, but, like, did you understand what it was? <laughs> so, like, if you read something and you find it boring, well, not understanding something is always boring. If I'm uh, reading something in German and my German is not too great and I have no idea what it means, I'm probably going to have a boring experience. But it's not because the text is boring. It's because I don't understand it. So, uh, so have that in mind as you read these really difficult texts. Uh, and then if you don't understand it, your number one tool is to ask a question. And that's what I've done in this first paragraph here. I've asked a question. And your job might be to read this, think about it, talk about it, until you have an answer to that question. I turn to reading as a solitary practice rather than as an educational enterprise. Solitary practice means like a solitary practice is like a, 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 a single thing. Solitary has to do with one person rather than a, an educational enterprise. The way we read now when we are alone with ourselves retains considerable continuity with the past. It hasn't changed very much in 600 years. It's just you and the words in front of you and your meaning that you bring to the words. However, is his uh, performing academy. Let's get this. My ideal reader, uh, Samuel Johnson, who you don't know, but he's another expert. He's someone who is, has a lot of respect. Ooh, 
What's that when you talk about a respected source? A little ethos. Who knew an experience? Blah blah blah. Okay, so now he's gonna go and he's gonna he's gonna quote these experts here. He's got Johnson. He talks about Bacon. He talks about my main man Emerson on the next page, which I'm gonna flip over to right now. He talks about uh, Emerson right here. So you want to underline these guys. Um, you don't know what historicism is, but that's okay. Uh, the enemy of history. So Harold Bloom, as a guy, he thinks that literature should first and foremost be regarded as art. You know? And uh, there's a lot of people who disagree with him that say that when we read Shakespeare, we should read it to learn about history. Or, um, you know, and he thinks that that's not really the case. We don't need to get too much into that, though. Uh, okay. It impresses with conviction that one nature wrote in the same reeds. So he puts all these things together, right? This is synthesis. He's synthesizing Bacon, Johnson, and Emerson into a formula for how to read. And this is something that you want to have highlighted, and I'm going to talk about for a while. All right. We're six minutes in here. We've got some time left. Find what comes near to you that can be put to the use of weighing and considering, and that addresses you as though you share one nature free of time's tyranny. And if you notice this idea of something being free of time's tyranny, this is what Bloom added, free of time's tyranny. So uh, this, this is this idea is that you don't want to get caught up in history. Like, what is great and what is powerful has always been great, and it always will be great. And he talks about Shakespeare, because Shakespeare is his main man. But, like, you all learned that when we read Shakespeare, it was no less true and powerful and worthwhile today in our culture than it was 600 years ago. And that's the idea about what is great in literature, is that it is great because it is universal, it is powerful, and it is beautiful. So, when you are reading, you are to do... Uh, Find what comes near to you. So this is one of our rules. I mean, this is one, something I want you to think about when you read all these essays, is that you have to find out where you and what you are reading, and I'll just say text, like, where is the intersection? Where do you overlap? Where does your life overlap with the life of the characters in your book? Where does your experience overlap with the person writing the essay? That, that's your job as a reader. And if you can't find an overlap, what you're reading is not really going to mean anything to you. So it's your job to find that area of intersection. Okay, that you can put to use of weighing and considering. Weighing and considering is like you determining what is important. Like what matters. All right, this is good stuff, right? This is like powerful stuff. This is not just uh, something for a test, but what matters. And that addresses you as though you share one nature, okay? And the one nature that we're talking about is like human nature. So Harold Bloom believes that literature reading is designed to help us um, like get closer to what is human in ourselves and to discover it. That's big stuff. That's cool. I think it's cool. All right. So I'm going to move forward now. Let's see. Ultimately, we read, as Bacon and Emerson agree, in order to strengthen the self. Strengthen the self and to learn its authentic interests. So we read to know ourselves. To I'm going to put discover. To discover ourselves. And he has got a lot of respect for this idea of the self, just like Emerson does. You know, the highest authority in your life is yourself. And you want to strengthen that authority by exposing yourself to literature that's great. And someone like Bloom and someone like me believes that that's the, one of the best ways that you can grow as a human being. Uh, we experience such uh, augmentations as pleasure. So it actually feels good to become a more powerful discoverer of yourself, a more knowledgeable person, a more uh, fluent speaker and understander of the world. 
it feels good. Uh, which may be why aesthetics, but I'm going to skip some of this. The Sarva professional reading. Okay, we're going to skip that until we get to King. I was talking about King Lear. This is according to him is the probably greatest piece of literature ever created. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Elitism, right? And this is uh, controversial here because he's saying that the more you read, like the maybe the better you are, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's kind of controversial. Mm, but yeah, it's kind of cool. All right, value in literature and in life has much to do with idiosyncrasy, with the with the excess by which meaning gets started. It is not an accidental that historicists to hear his people. He don't he doesn't like these historicists, right? And nothing you know, not that history isn't valuable. He's just saying that the most important thing about literature is not, you know, what it says about the historical time. He says that it's this universal humanity is the big deal. Okay, uh, let's see. So I'm going to get to this first one, his first rule here, which some of you have written down. And you'll notice here that he says, clear your mind of can't. Can't, and he defines it for you because it's not a word that um, a lot of people know. Your dictionary will tell you that can't, notice there's no apostrophe here, it's not cannot. In this sense, is speech overflowing with pious platitudes, the particular vocabulary of sect or coven. So he's saying that, like, can't is a... Um, the easiest way to say it is like slant, bias, um, platitudes. Platitudes, you don't have a lot of respect for platitudes. Um, okay, he doesn't like multiculturalism, which again is his point of view. And uh, there are probably people in this building that disagree with that. I might be one of them. But the good stuff... Are these four things. Okay, clear your mind of can't. And we'll go through here. The second principle, do not attempt to improve your neighbor 